You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. President Biden is set to sign an executive order restricting overseas sharing by data brokers. U.S. federal agencies warn of exploited ubiquity edge routers. A new ransomware operator claims to have hacked Epic Games. A cross-site scripting issue leaves millions of WordPress sites vulnerable. The Riceta Ransomware Group posts a multi-million dollar ransom demand on a children's hospital in Chicago. Mandiant tracks Chinese threat actors targeting Avante VPNs. The former head of DHS weighs in on a federal cyber insurance backstop. Domain registrars offer bulk name blocking for brands. Our guest is Magpie Graham, principal adversary hunter and technical director at Dragos, reviewing the key findings of Dragos's cybersecurity year in review report. And cameo celebrities are taken out of context for political gains. It's Wednesday, February 28th, 2024. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is your CyberWire Intel Briefing. President Joe Biden is set to sign an executive order to prevent the mass transfer of sensitive personal data of Americans to countries like China, Russia, and Iran. Targeting data brokers, the order mandates the Department of Justice to start a rulemaking process to restrict the bulk sharing of data, including genomic, biometric, health, geolocation, financial data, and personally identifiable information. Aimed at addressing national security risks, the initiative emphasizes collaboration with industry stakeholders to ensure the implementability of these rules while safeguarding national security interests. The process, expected to extend over months or years, will prohibit specific data broker transactions and establish restricted data transaction categories to protect critical security components. Additionally, it directs key departments to review federal grants and contracts to prevent sensitive health data from being transferred to the banned countries. This order focuses on the transfer of data overseas without imposing new domestic data handling standards. Previous administrations have highlighted concerns over foreign adversaries, particularly China, acquiring Americans' data through hacking or commercial transactions, with potential uses ranging from identifying intelligence agents to training AI models. The FBI, NSA, U.S. Cyber Command, and international partners have issued a cybersecurity advisory warning about Russian state-sponsored actors exploiting ubiquity edge routers for cyber attacks. These actors, identified as APT28 or Fancy Bear, have targeted various sectors across multiple countries since 2022, using compromised routers for operations like credential theft and establishing malicious landing pages. They've exploited vulnerabilities, including a patched zero-day, to install tools enabling further attacks. The FBI has discovered indicators of compromise and recommends remediating affected routers through hardware resets, firmware updates, and enhanced security measures. Network owners are advised to update systems and Outlook to protect against specific vulnerabilities exploited by these actors. A report out of Australia says the Mogilevich Gang, a new player in the ransomware arena, claims to have hacked Epic Games, the studio famous for Fortnite, Unreal Tournament, and Gears of War. 
Mogilevich alleges possession of 189 gigabytes of data, including emails, passwords, payment information, and source code. The data is advertised for sale on their Darknet site, with a hyperlink directing potential buyers to a contact page. Despite setting a deadline for March 4th for Epic Games to respond or for someone to buy the data, Mogilevich has not disclosed a ransom amount or provided evidence of the hack. A critical stored cross-site scripting vulnerability has been found in the Lightspeed cache plugin for WordPress, affecting over 4 million WordPress sites. This flaw could let attackers execute malicious scripts by failing to sanitize user input. The vulnerability puts unpatched sites at risk of data theft and unauthorized access. Users are urged to update to version 5.7.0.1 or later for protection. A ransomware attack by the Riceta Group on Chicago's Lurie Children's Hospital has led to a $3.4 million ransom demand. Lurie Children's Hospital is a major pediatric center in the Midwest. The facility remains operational but has experienced disruptions, including canceled appointments and surgeries. The hospital is actively working on system recovery and advises patients to bring printed insurance cards and medication lists to appointments. The Riceta Group, known for targeting healthcare institutions, has listed the stolen data for sale for 60 Bitcoin. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has previously issued warnings about Riceta's increasing focus on the healthcare sector. Chinese cyber espionage group UNC-5325 has exploited vulnerabilities in Avanti Connect Secure VPN to deploy new malware for persistence despite patches. These attacks, following initial zero-day exploits reported by Veloxity, involve sophisticated malware like Little Lamb Wool Tea and Pit Stop, aimed at U.S. and Asia-Pacific region targets in defense, technology, and telecom. Mandiant's analysis reveals UNC-5325's deep understanding of Avanti appliances. Using malware and modified tools to evade detection and persist through updates. Despite their sophistication, Mandiant says the group's attempt to persist through a factory reset failed due to encryption key changes. This activity underscores the ongoing threat from Chinese actors leveraging zero-day vulnerabilities against critical infrastructure. In the wake of the devastating NotPetya cyber attack in 2017, pharmaceutical giant Merck found itself in a protracted legal battle over a $700 million insurance claim. This case spotlighted a growing concern in the digital age. Who bears the financial responsibility for massive state-sponsored cyber attacks? Insurers contested Merck's claim, arguing that the attack attributed to the Russian government was a hostile or warlike act, excluding it from standard property and casualty coverage. This dispute underscored a critical gap in the cybersecurity insurance market, the difficulty in covering losses from cyber attacks that have the scale and impact of military actions. In a recent appearance on the Cyber War podcast, former Department of Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff proposed a solution akin to the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act of 2002, which was created in response to the 9-11 attacks and provided a federal backstop for insurance claims related to terrorism. Chertoff's suggestion was for the federal government to serve as a financial backstop for insurers in the event of catastrophic cyber attacks, offering a layer of security to both insurers and policyholders against the unpredictable and potentially immense costs of such incidents. The debate over a federal backstop highlights the need for clear criteria and definitions for what constitutes a cyber attack warranting government support. This includes considerations around the attack's perpetrator, motives, and the extent of damage caused. The complexity of attributing cyber attacks to specific actors and understanding their impacts complicates the establishment of such a framework. Moreover, the proposal raises questions about moral hazard— where companies might underinvest in cybersecurity measures if they expect government bailouts for significant attacks. This concern underscores the importance of tying any federal support to stringent cybersecurity standards. 
ensuring that only those who take reasonable precautions to secure their networks can qualify for assistance. Domain name registrars are now offering a service called Global Block, which enables businesses to block registration of domain names infringing on their brand, including homoglyphs and variations. This service provides subscription-based protection against domain squatting and phishing attacks. For instance, it can prevent the registration of domains that misuse or mimic brand names, addressing issues like typo squatting and homograph attacks. While the service could streamline brand protection and reduce the need for manual domain registration, it does raise concerns about free speech and domain hoarding. Critics, including the EFF, argue that such automated blocking might suppress legitimate expression and discussion about brands, as domains themselves can be a form of speech. The debate centers on finding a balance between protecting trademarks and ensuring freedom of expression online. Coming up after the break, my conversation with Magpie Graham, Principal Adversary Hunter and Technical Director at Dragos. We're reviewing the key findings of Dragos's Cybersecurity Year in Review report. Stay with us. Managing the requirements for modern security programs is increasingly challenging and time-consuming. Enter Vanta. Vanta gives you one place to centralize and scale your security program, quickly assess risk, streamline security reviews, and automate compliance for ISO 27001, SOC 2, and more. You can leverage Vanta's market-leading trust management platform to unify risk management and secure the trust of your customers. Plus, use Vanta AI to save time when completing security questionnaires. CyberWire daily listeners can get $1,000 off by going to vanta.com slash cyber. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash cyber. Struggling to secure on-prem apps with modern identity? Don't worry, you're not alone. Join industry leaders from Fortune 500 organizations to secure your apps on any cloud with any IDP, regardless of your environment's complexity. Meet Strata's identity orchestration platform, Mavericks. Say goodbye to the headaches of app refactoring and legacy tech debt. With identity orchestration, you can modernize legacy apps to use MFA or passwordless authentication in a few weeks, migrate from one IDP to another, and so much more without changing the app. No matter your IAM use case, Strata extends the value of your current identity investments. And the best part? You can try it for free today. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire to share your biggest identity challenge, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. Don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. Magpie Graham is Principal Adversary Hunter and Technical Director at Dragos, and I recently had a conversation with him over on the Control Loop podcast about Dragos's Cybersecurity Year in Review report. Here's part of our conversation. So this is something that we've been doing for, uh, well, pretty much every year that Dragos has been around. Uh, it's a, an opportunity really to, to be able to kind of summarize what we've seen uh, over the, the last 12 months, bring additional context to maybe some of the blog posts that we've put out during that time, and share other insights that have maybe been in our private reporting, but really is a, a great channel to be able to talk about the things we've seen through service engagements uh, and talk a little bit about maybe where we're going is, you know, OT security or cybersecurity, um, you know, in terms of maturity. It's it's not new OT, 
But security in OT, cybersecurity in particular, I think is something that's still um, very much a, a nascent uh, thing for many organizations. And this is a great way for us to be able to kind of reinforce the messages of what does need to be done, but also highlight success stories as well. Well, let's dig into some of the details here because there is a lot to cover. Uh, one of the things that caught my eye was was this notion of of assessing your external infrastructure and the importance of that. Can, can you flesh that out for us? Yeah, so I think one of the things where uh, we've seen a lot of change, it's partially due to the pandemic, but I think it comes from the, the moving forward to kind of that digital transformation, which happened with OT and IT you know, a long time ago, but continues today, particularly with more cloud-connected devices, uh, vendors baking in that ability to, to manage things more uh, remotely through their, their own service offerings, but also the use of uh, the kind of I IoT devices there, particularly for monitoring, but not necessarily exclusively one way in terms of their communications, that provide that route into the OT environment. It used to be that you probably had to connect to your IT network and pivot through to manage uh, the OT assets, if that was even possible. Um, certainly with folk working from home during the pandemic, we saw a rise of more remote administration of, of those OT networks, and many, in many cases, directly connecting to them. Now, Controlling infrastructure, I guess, the VPNs and firewalls that are there often badge differently, but usually the, the same types of device that we see in the uh, the enterprise IT world. And that's something where we saw a, a huge rise in the development of, of exploits for vulnerabilities in, in these devices, uh, and then the subsequent exploitation of those kind of en masse. So it does pose a, a larger risk to be able to um, directly get into that environment now more so than ever before. Uh, and so that's why really being able to kind of take those those uh, hard learned lessons from from the enterprise IT side, penetration testing, uh, good patching policy, you know, checking that those rules are really on the firewall, uh, deleting you know users that perhaps are no longer with the organization, um, and also just maintaining that separation, not necessarily from a, from a network perspective, but things like credentials. Do you have the same credentials being used in those two environments? Maybe that's something you can change additional layers of authentication that perhaps you know, weren't uh, originally thought to be required when accessing the OT environment internally. But now that the external route is the, the way forward, then that's something that you know, maybe needs to be considered as well. Well, you mentioned uh, separation, and that uh, reminds me of segmentation. Uh, that's something that the report highlights as well. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that we you know stress quite frequently really is the the SANS five critical controls, and this is a great sort of way to to really take stock of of where you can make big impacts in the security of your network, and that does include things like secure remote access, as we've just discussed, but that whole notion of defensible architecture. Admittedly, a lot of OT environments have been around a long time. To change those is you know difficult and costly, but for any kind of new development or whether there is that opportunity to re-architect, thinking about uh, you know, different zones, the ability to have those kind of uh, different layers of security built into the different logical layers of where the devices are, uh, the, the notion of um, the zones and conduits to allow maybe access to only certain devices from certain areas of that network. They can all be you know, really, really useful uh, tools in terms of creating a more difficult environment for an adversary to operate. Uh, and alongside that, I think, you know, the, the monitoring piece is probably the, the piece that we're best known for, but also the piece that is just uh, not, not as developed in, in OT cybersecurity as it needs to be. I think we, um, we estimate less than 5% of OT networks are actually monitored globally. You could never imagine that that would be the statistics for an enterprise IT network that, you know, 5% is, is the only uh, number of, or the only proportion that would have any form of, you know, monitoring appliances within it. So I think that's something that really needs to change. One of the things that your report highlights is uh, the importance of, of monitoring outbound communications. C can you uh, go through that for us? What are some of the details here? I think uh, one of the things that always surprises me, even though <laughs> I've been at Dragos for sort of over two years now, is the mm. fact that the, there are external connections from the ICS environment. Uh, most people that seem to, you know, have worked in that area for a long time. And I'm not necessarily talking, you know, 
uh, OT, cybersecurity, that those professionals are still quite you know few in number. But I'm talking about the folk who are operating those devices day to day, responsible for the you know the the configuration and the um, the correct running of those systems. Uh, there is a, I think, a, a misconception um, that there is uh, air gaps or better segregation than there is, and that there isn't those abilities uh, or opportunities for external communications to leave that environment. And that's not really true. We still see um, uh, not just the the ability for for um, you know, PLCs and historians and all manner of ICS equipment to be able to talk out to the internet. Uh, generally, not even just via you know a channel to maybe the um, the vendor that that, uh, that created the device, but in about twenty percent of those engagements that we've had, uh, we actually see directly externally facing. Uh, ICS equipment. So that's the HMI is directly addressable on the internet. And this is something that I think we've seen, you know, is a is kind of low hanging fruit when you think about it from an attacker's perspective, particularly um, with kind of hacktivist activity. We've seen more, most recently, I guess, the uh, Cyber Avengers uh, compromising a, a number of devices um, you know, in support of uh, of obviously uh, a cause that uh, that they stand behind, but I think the impact was obviously far outside the the, the Middle East in terms of uh, the regions that were targeted, and this does, in some ways, you know. Uh, linked to, I guess, where those devices are in the world, but particularly, um, I think uh, you know the, the ability to scan for a, a common host that you have a, a working exploit against, or some vulnerability that you know you can exploit, uh, even if it is you know, a, a baked in uh, password. This has a huge impact when it comes to being able to push that message to be able to show that that maybe not everything is safe as as you might uh, as you might think. Um, so in this case, it was the Unitronics Vision PLCs, but our investigation showed that other, you know, um, Unistream series PLCs were vulnerable as well. And that's not just that, you know, one particular vendor. I think this is this is something that is is occasionally discovered, um, but is more and more on the focus of that kind of research that threat actors are doing. Um, and I think it's just something where actually um, it can have that global impact. It can hit the news cycle. And particularly in the terms of, uh, or in the, I guess, the support of, of hacktivism, when there's a, a more of a, a message and ideology perhaps to push, this is a great way to be able to do it, as we you know probably saw with website defacements in, mm. in the kind of, uh, in the, the 90s and, and early 2000s. I think this is now, uh, you feel like Perhaps they're able to strike at something a little bit more sensitive. Uh, and here, you know, we didn't see them necessarily go for a disruptive attack or a destructive attack. But we would regard that as stage two. Nevertheless, they're in the OT environment. They have the capability to operate there. Um, so I think this is one of the cases where if you're doing conducting that kind of external testing, you might be able to find those weaknesses. But it is also thinking about you know, the, the the placement of those devices. Sometimes it's uh, it, it's better in terms of I guess usability, particularly with remote connectivity. And a lot of sites, you know, don't necessarily have human staff working there. It, it might be that someone visits every six months or twelve months. But that's where you need to focus your efforts in terms of doing that additional monitoring, that additional kind of locking down of those assets, because it could be the the weak link in the chain. For the the folks out there who who are working day to day, you know the, those practitioners who are tasked with protecting the organization and also getting the support from from their leadership. Uh, what are the take homes from this report? What, what are the the tips and words of wisdom for them? Well, we chatted a little bit there about ransomware, and I think uh, although this can feel like a, a, you know a problem that plagues networks uh, day in day out. Um, in terms of the focus on industrial organizations and, and those that have the potential to Im impact OT networks, uh, we did see that a quarter of those attacks all came from Lockbit. So in terms of kind of uh, putting the, uh, the focus into particular areas, I would say if you can protect your network from the TTPs of the Lockbit group, then you've already reduced the 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 potential for uh, you know that attack to affect your OT network considerably. Then looking at the kind of next levels down, we've got um, Black Cat or Alpha V and, and Black Buster, each account for a nine percent themselves. So those top three groups already mean that you you know you're fairly well protected uh, from ransomware attacks if you can just you know essentially run through those TDPs, use the MITRE attack framework, ensure that you have safeguards in place for the way that they might operate. 
one other thing um, that I think really is, you know, is something that we don't necessarily see very often in the more IT-centric threat intelligence reporting, but it's certainly something that uh, Dragos has, you know, really strives to to try and, I guess, correct um, and, and put out there with our customers is the uh, the notion of, of vulnerabilities and what you can do in terms of patching and how you can prioritize that uh, patching or mitigation. So. Um, the statistics are all there in the year in review, but I think we're, we're seeing, you know, a continued trend that the bulletins that are released by vendors are are full of incorrect information. So this tends to be the prioritization uh, methodology. Is this a you know high severity or is it low severity? We often find that those are completely wrong. We do find that there's um, missing versions that are also vulnerable to something. And this is something where we break down every bulletin that comes out as well as doing our own research to, to find these vulnerabilities, but also release the information that says, well, this is maybe how you can mitigate if patching is something that you just can't do which is very much the case for OT networks, you know, not necessarily so uh, so difficult in, a, in an IT network. Um, but I think um, when you look at the, the prioritization process as well, we have a now, next, never methodology. And only 3% of those vulnerabilities in the, in the last 12 months, would we say that you need to you know, you need to put a mitigation or a patch in place right now. Those are the ones that are likely being exploited in the wild, or they're so severe that the loss of um, visibility or the loss of control, you know, could have serious effects that could lead to um, you know, dangerous conditions within a plant. Sixty-eight percent of those, they can wait until your next uh, patch cycle. When you take that kit out of circulation and you're doing the other maintenance on it, that's the time when it would be reasonable to make those changes, whether it's a patch or another form of mitigation. But almost a third they're probably never going to be exploited. They're so deep within the environment that it would be very difficult for an adversary to, to, to actually use them in a real-world context. Or they pose no threat at all. Yes, it's a vulnerability, but to exploit it doesn't buy that threat after anything. Uh, and I think that's something really where you can help sort through what might seem an insurmountable problem by having a way to prioritize exactly where you put your resources and your time because it's not a trivial process to go and apply these uh, changes to the OT environment. So this is a real great way of, of, of uh, making you feel like you can you know, tick some boxes and, and feel like you've made a real impact in the security of your network. That's Magpie Graham from Dragos. You can hear the rest of our conversation on the Control Loop podcast, you can find that on our website or wherever you find your podcasts. Hey everybody, I want to take a few minutes here and talk about our sponsor, Splunk. You know, you need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. And finally, our B-list celebrity desk tells us of a strange but ultimately predictable case of online misinformation. A TikTok video using paid cameo messages from celebrities like Dolph Lundgren and Lindsay Lohan falsely claimed Hollywood stars supported overthrowing Moldova's pro-European president, Mai Sandu. The celebrities, unaware of the video's political motive, were tricked into participating believing they were offering personal messages. Cameo is a platform where ordinary folks can pay celebrities to record short greetings and messages for family members and loved ones, wishing them a happy birthday or congratulating them on a promotion or an anniversary. Cameo, of course, condemns misuse and faces serious challenges in preventing its platform from being exploited for deceptive purposes. Of course, clever editing of video clips to achieve a specific outcome is nothing new. Way back in Season 5 of The Simpsons, 
Smithers accidentally shared with Lisa Simpson a clip he had hastily assembled of Mr. Burns. Hello, Smithers. You're quite good at turning me on. Um, you probably should ignore that. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like The Cyberwire are part of the daily intelligence routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, as well as the critical security teams supporting the Fortune 500 and many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Stokes. Our mixer is Trey Hester with original music by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producers are Jennifer Iben and Brandon Karp. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Imagine a world where you're always one step ahead of cyber threats, where your defenses are impenetrable because you see what others don't. Welcome to Team Cymru's Threat Intelligence Solutions. With real-time access to the world's largest threat intelligence data ocean, they enable you to turn the tables on attackers. Transform your security from reactive to proactive through accelerated threat hunting and incident response, made possible through automation. Empower your team with visibility and insights to start defending your organization like never before. Team Cymru. Be the hunter, not the hunted. Learn more at team-cymru.com slash cyberwire. That's team-cymru.com slash cyberwire.